Hello, Johnny from Eurogamer here, and this is Life is Strange 2. If you've had an eye on the channel this week, you'll have seen that Aoife sat down with Michel Co. He's the co-creator of Life is Strange and co-game director on Life is Strange 2. There's a whole hour of them playing through the game and talking about the design decisions that shaped it, so if you've got the time to spare, I highly recommend you check it out. Some of the things Michelle revealed during the recording were so interesting though, I decided to pull them out and make this, eight cool things we learned about Life is Strange 2. Spoilers ahead, obviously, so if for some reason you haven't played Life is Strange 2, you'd better stop watching now. First, let's get the unpleasantness out of the way first. It's time to talk about Mushroom. From the moment Daniel uncovered the adorable little puppy in the back of Brody's car in episode 1, we knew we were in love with Mushroom, but we were also terrified that something bad might happen to her. Lo and behold, in episode 2, the worst occurred and a cougar killed Daniel's beloved pet. Like a lot of the Life is Strange community, we were devastated, but we also couldn't help asking, why? Having a young dog with you when you're on the run from the police, and also a child yourself, isn't really practical, sure, but did she really have to die? According to Michelle, yeah, pretty much. The idea behind the heartbreaking scene was to demonstrate the destructive capabilities of Daniel's power, not just to us, but to the boys themselves as well. Remember that Daniel has no memory of the incident at the start of the first episode that saw his father Esteban shot dead, and Sean's view of what was going on at the time wasn't exactly crystal clear either. With that in mind, it was important the Diaz brothers be afforded the opportunity to see just how dangerous this power can be. According to Michelle, in order to really bring that scene home, they needed something big to happen. Daniel needed to be provoked enough that he consider turning his powers on another living creature, and the players needed to be provoked enough that they'd consider letting him do it. And so, Mushroom's death came to be. Daniel's reaction is raw enough that he'd consider killing something, and with it being an animal rather than a person, there's every chance the player might consider Daniel's revenge justified, even if they know deep down it's the wrong thing to be teaching him at that moment. It's still a harsh scene, and don't get me wrong, I am still not over Mushroom's death, but it's nice to know a good amount of thought went into it. And for the record, I am so glad we spared the cougar. I went back to see what would have happened if we hadn't calmed Daniel down, and, well, it's pretty brutal. Next up, while we're talking about Daniel's powers, did you know they directly influenced the game's soundtrack? While the licensed tracks in Life is Strange 2 were chosen partly to reflect Sean's music taste and set him apart from the super indie bopping Max Caulfield, the music composed specifically for the game is much more electronica influenced than it was in the first season. The composer is the same, but Michelle told us the music was pushed in a new direction partly to reflect how different Daniel's powers are to Max's. While Max's power is very calm and floaty, allowing her to rewind time and take herself out of the moment, Daniel's power is much more immediate and, as we've already seen, considerably more violent in terms of its impact on the world around him. So if you ever thought Life is Strange 2 sounded familiar but somehow different, well, now you know why. While Sean and Max may differ in terms of their music tastes, mind you, they still share some pretty fundamental similarities. Not least, as we found out, how they were created in the first place. Even though Max is a very cautious individual by nature, whereas Sean likes smoking weed, tagging walls and going to parties, Don't Nod actually made these two characters in the same way. The trick, we were told, is to give them a personality, but to make sure it doesn't take up too much space. In other words, while we do get a sense of these characters and what they stand for, there still needs to be room for player choices. That's not to say these characters are vacant, of course. I think it's more the case that players build up an idea of who their version of these people are through the choices they make. 
In the playthrough Aoife and I are doing, for example, Sean is governed more by his head than his heart. For what it's worth though, I think the balance is a bit better this time round. Max at times could be a bit too much of a blank slate in the first Life is Strange, so it was nice to see Sean asserting himself a bit more in the sequel. Talking of the decisions Sean makes, have you ever felt like Life is Strange 2 makes it hard to be the nicest big brother you can be while also teaching Daniel the importance of doing the right thing? It's not just your imagination, Don't Nod is deliberately messing with you. As a way of highlighting the tensions involved in trying to raise a child while living life on the run, the game systems deliberately play being the good brother off against teaching Daniel the right thing, meaning if you overindulge him then he's likely to take liberties, but being too harsh will make him stubborn. To be honest we suspected this one might be the case, it was just good to have it confirmed. Don't nod can be so cruel sometimes. The next item on our list is all about Hot Dog Man, who, of course, makes an appearance in the motel in Life is Strange 2's second episode, but who was first introduced in the original Life is Strange. Interestingly, we found out Hot Dog Man was never intended to be such a big deal, but Don't Nod underestimated just how much fans would like him. See, originally Hot Dog Man appeared in the alternate timeline in Life is Strange as an action figure in Chloe's bedroom and on a t-shirt in one of Max's selfies. And fans really, really latched onto it. So much so, in fact, Don't Nod decided to feature him a bit more, and a bit more, until he's one of the most instantly recognisable things from the Life is Strange universe. The benefits of releasing an episodic game and paying attention to your audience, I suppose. Of course, making Hot Dog Man more prominent isn't the only work that goes into Life is Strange between releases. Indeed, the AI was really stepped up between the first Life is Strange and Life is Strange 2. See, whereas you spent vast chunks of Life is Strange walking about by yourself, Sean is almost always flanked by younger brother Daniel. The places he goes, the things he says, and the actions he takes are directly influenced by what it is you're doing, and all of it is done on a scale we've not really seen from the series thus far. Sure, there were similar scenes in Life is Strange, like when Chloe and Max were snooping around in Frank's RV, or when Max is assembling clues on the board in Chloe's room, but Chloe is always sitting down in those instances. She's a static point around which the rest of the action happens. Sean and Daniel, on the other hand, are always on the move. The things Daniel notices and the way he reacts to them depend on what you're doing from one moment to the next, and apparently it was a lot of work to get the game's AI into a state whereby that would work as fluidly as it needs to. Classic Daniel, really. He's a sweet kid, but he sure does make things more difficult for others. Just two items left on our list, and the first is about the planes near the start of episode one. While sitting on Sean's porch, Lila talks about the planes flying low over their neighbourhood, saying she knows she ought to hate them and their noise pollution, but that she feels she'd miss them if she ever moved away. Apparently these planes and this very specific type of neighbourhood was inspired by a road trip Michelle and other Don't Not employees went on as they commemorated the end of Life is Strange Season 1 and began thinking about the second. Specifically, it was some neighbourhoods next to Seattle under the flight paths out of Tacoma Airport. They're very distinctive neighbourhoods where the houses are less expensive and the team felt like they were good inspiration for the sort of family atmosphere they wanted to portray with Lila, with the Diaz brothers and, of course, with their father Esteban. They also hoped it might be a treat for the people familiar with those neighbourhoods themselves, which is pretty sweet. Last and most importantly, we finally got a definitive answer on Brody in Life is Strange 2, and no, he is not based on me. Ever since the trailer first emerged, people have been telling me I look like this particular character, leading to this moment during our playthrough. Good. <laughs> yes, I'm aware that there's a character that looks like me. That guy looks like a freaking Oh, stalker. fuck! Come on! What did he say? This guy looks like a freaking stalker. 
Eva oh. asked Michel directly, and he said it was just a coincidence, even though it is a surprisingly strong resemblance. So there we go, we can finally put that one to rest. Unless they're just saying that to avoid paying royalties, in which case I'm going to kick off. Anyway, that'll about do it. Eight cool things we learned about Life is Strange 2. Hopefully you learned something interesting. Don't forget you can hear all sorts of good stuff about Life is Strange 2 in the full interview, which is live on our channel now. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, we've got loads more for you to watch, including full playthroughs of Life is Strange, Life is Strange Before the Storm, and Life is Strange 2 so far. Some of them should be on screen now, so do give one of those a click. Do like, subscribe, and ring the bell icon so you don't miss anything else from Eurogamer, but most importantly, thank you very much for watching, and have a lovely day.